In today's video, we're going to be discussing submarine patents, and along with that, we're going to be discussing the concept of paper patents as well. This is video number 19 in the series. After I had finished doing video number 18, where I shared with you some of the intricacies of my 742 patent, such as how I came upon the idea, the problem, how it was going to be a novel invention. I shared with you some of the materials that I went through and the material that I would settle upon, a key element, prototyping, and the thought process behind my claims. And as I was putting that video up, I said to myself, why in heaven's sake would I ever tell anybody about my patent application prior to me receiving a grant? So I had a, I had a moment of stark terror and paranoia. You know, I had filmed this little video and I put it up and I said, that was really a stupid thing to do. You should never do anything like that. And then I grabbed a hold of myself and I said, nah, it's fine. So I want to explain something to you, something that you might not be aware of. In November of 2000, thereabouts, as the U.S. Patent Office was more and more adopting the European filing system of patents in particular, they came out with a a ruling, an edict, a law, so to speak, that patent applications would be public, would become publicized after an 18 month period. Well, that changed everything. That was also under the American Invents Act, the first to file. It used to be the first to invent. And as I had mentioned in a prior video or two, We've started following the European model, and now it's the first to file. So, my patent for the Tangle Free Flag, I told you I did something very dangerous. I filed it on the 365th day of my priority date, and my patent for the Tangle free flag as far as a provisional patent was going to expire that night at midnight. So I was in a rush to get it into the hands of the office and file it before midnight so I wouldn't lose my priority date. Okay. There's also a provision I could have filed with the office that I wasn't aware of at the time that I could request to have my patent application remain a secret. But I didn't know about it and I didn't so much care about it anyway. And there was a reason for it. The main reason is this patent, unlike the other two patents I had filed in the late 80s, early 90s, this patent has 16 claims. I also did a professional patent search and I paid over $800 for that. And when the search came back, I saw all the various patents that had been granted for Tangle Proof or Tangle Free Flags, however you want to call it. And the overwhelming majority of these applications, these patent grants, had stiffeners that ran throughout the flag. The flags would be stiff. They wouldn't... They wouldn't be loose like we're used to seeing. They had various hardware and appurtenances and equipment. They were cumbersome. They looked like the improvement costs would be prohibitive. Plus it went against everything that people who enjoy a good flag would be missing, such as the furl, how it droops, how it drapes, and how it flies under sail. So when I got that patent search back, 
I was very encouraged to move ahead with what I was going to do. So I wrote myself out quite a lengthy provisional patent application. And then I did flying trials for virtually a year before I was finally satisfied to the point that I was going to file a non-provisional. Also, the 742 patent at this point doesn't have any trade secrets, so I wasn't giving anything away. As it turns out, in November of 2000, when they passed this law that these patent applications would become public, it was supposed to be an 18-month period of secrecy. Well, they didn't adhere to that, and they haven't been adhering to that for a long time. My patent was published within six months' time. So their 18-month promise of secrecy went out the window. And that has been a fact, and it's a known thing, and people have been discussing it and writing about it. All right, so now you're updated as to why I spoke to you about my patent. Because the 901 patent I had filed and the 842 patent I had filed had trade secrets, and I would have never ever had breathed the word to anybody about those patent applications while they're in the pending stage because they had trade secrets. And it was before the year 2000 when they were granted and all inventors adhered to this secrecy. You couldn't get any information from the patent office about anybody's application. And that's called a wrapper file. So what you file initially with the government in the form of a patent is called the file. And they refer to that as the wrapper file. All right, now that I brought you up to speed, let's talk about submarine patents. And the practitioner and the expert of submarine patents was a man named Jerome Lemelson. He was born in the late 30s. He died around 1997, I believe. And he had over 700 patents to his credit. Now, he was a visionary of technology of sorts. And he would file these applications habitually. And he would keep his applications alive in the patent office until that technology was actually perfected and brought out into the marketplace. Then he threw continuation and parts and different games that he would play, that he was an expert practitioner at the game of filing patents and beating the United States PTO at their own gang, game using their own rules. He would then polish up his claims, hopefully get his patent granted, and then he would file in federal district court a patent infringement case against a major technology producer and they would be taken to their knees and they would have to pay him royalties or settle with him. Now, the two famous products that he was successful with was the barcode, which is those lines you see on each and every package. Each and every item has a barcode now. Well, he dreamt up the barcode patent application as it's said back in the mid to late 50s and kept it alive until the 80s or 90s. He was able to keep a patent application alive under the old system for decades. And much like a trap, much like a Venus flytrap, once a company or an individual brought the product out and made a going concern of it, it was making money and it was going to set the stage for a new technology, he would spring a lawsuit on him and it would be a death match and he would win. He beat Hot Wheels that was owned by Mattel to their own version of the Hot Wheels track that the Hot Wheels cars ran on. 
So he was successful with both the barcode and the Hot Wheels track and many more uh, technologies that came down the pike or innovations or new products. And he and his estate was successful to the tune of a half a billion dollars in earnings from these patent lawsuits. And they were really frivolous, actually. He was an opportunist. You see, the patents he filed were what they call paper patents. And that's one of the reasons why I'm doing this video for you. Paper patents are nothing more than patents that are filed for a concept. No proof of work, no proof of concept, they're just filed. It's almost as if you, and I discourage this greatly, file a worthless patent, receive it, it's suitable for framing, you put it on your living room wall or your family room wall, and it doesn't earn you a dime. That's not what this series is about. This is a not a, this series is not about amassing patents and so you can call yourself an inventor and that you're a published inventor and you have patents. That's not what this is about. This is about ideas, innovation, product development, and patents is one way to protect ourselves. But if you have a patent and you can't earn any money from it, it's a fool's errand. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of effort. And big deal, you have a piece of paper or a plaque hanging on the wall suitable for framing. Well, that's what Jerome Lemelson did. And he did that to the tune of around 700 patents because most of his patents were filed in a submarine patent or a paper patent fashion. Now, I'm not an expert on him. Maybe he did do prototypes on some ideas, but that's not what he's famous for. So here's a little tidbit. When I was looking for help to sue Honeywell International over my additive treated oil filter patents that they had violated, I went looking and I spent a good year, year and a half seeking law firms that would take me on. And at the time, and I'm not up to speed on this at all by today's standards because I'm way out of this and I'm not looking to get into any more lawsuits. There was a famous law firm out of Chicago. It was called Niro and Niro. And they were one of the premier small boutique law firms that would sue people or represent inventors, their intellectual property interests, their lawsuits, patent infringement claims on a contingency. I called Niro and Niro and I was fortunate and I was able to speak to the principals and they liked my lawsuit against Honeywell. Everybody liked my lawsuit against Honeywell because Litton Industries had sued Honeywell over a technology, I think it had to do with lasers. And the lawsuit settled for $400 million. So all as I had to do once I was on the phone was to say that I was an inventor, I did this, I did that, these are my claims, it's a patent infringement lawsuit against Honeywell and I would recite the lawsuit of Litton versus Honeywell and it settled for $400 uh, million. And every lawyer would come to the phone, both big and small. And I'm talking lawyers of giant killing proportions gave me their hotel room phone numbers, gave me their home phone numbers. I spoke to major attorneys on nights and weekends at their homes because it was blood in the water once I mentioned Honeywell and Litton Industries. Anyway, Niro and Niro referred me to Jerome Lemelson's main attorney, main enforcer, and he was prolific when it came to 
paper patents and submarine patents and defending the Lemelson estate. At the time, Jerry Hosier, who was a partner of Nairo and Nairo, he went out on his own and he moved to the mountains of Aspen. They gave me his home number. Now, I'm not sure if it was just his home number or his home office number, but they gave me his phone number. They liked me that much and they saw that I had a need and they gave me an ex-partner's contact and I called Jerry Hosier. And if I can recall correctly, his housekeeper answered the phone and eventually he, he came and picked up and we had a long conversation. And I spoke to him and again, it was Litton versus Honeywell and I'm a sole inventor and I'm suing Honeywell over various patent infringement claims, trade secret claims, etc. And any intellectual property attorney worth their salt would come to the phone. But he couldn't take me on either. Just like Nairo and Nairo, Jerry was busy with the Lemelsons. Jerry was busy making 30 to 40 million dollars a year defending the Lemelson estate. So he wasn't going to take me on, but nonetheless, he was interested enough to talk to me. I had many, many giant killer attorneys come to the phone. So I'll tell you one last ditty and this will blow your mind and you'll really think I'm making this up, but I'm not. Back when I started doing research for attorneys to represent me against Honeywell, I had just gotten over the fear of, the, of going on the internet. I had a home computer that I had bought for my five-year-old daughter. We had to get her ready for the world. Daddy could hook it up and get everything ready, but he never used the word processor. Eventually I would because I wrote two books off of that computer. And eventually I'd go on the internet, which I had hooked up, but I never went on. I had AOL and I never went on, but eventually I did. So I started looking for giant killers. Willie Gary out of West Palm Beach in Florida. Jerry Gansfried of Howry, Simon, Arnold and White. I had an actual personal meeting with Jerry. Um, I romanced a lot of big attorneys, but they would just never do it because their billable hours per head back at that time, back in the early 2000s, the late 1990s, was $1,000 an hour 22 years ago. And they had customers lined up to take on and they could get $1,000 an hour plus from anybody. So I'm looking up major law firms because I want a major law firm to represent me against Honeywell. So I looked up this firm in Washington. It was called Hogan and Hartston. And I was going through the list of senior partners and this one guy's resume was staggering and his name was John Roberts. And I called, I, they, put you through to his personal assistant, his personal secretary. And I speak to Mr. Roberts for a half an hour. And in the end, he told me he loved my case. He was smitten by it. He was interested in knowing all the facets, but he said, sorry, Steve, we can't take it. We don't do it, but I just really wanted to listen to you. And, uh, give you some words of wisdom and to tell you to keep, keep the fight up. Well, that John Roberts is the very same John Roberts who is now the chief justice on the Supreme Court. I also spoke to a, a brilliant attorney who was an antitrust expert out of San Francisco, Townsend, Townsend and Crew. His name was Gene Crew, and he had won hundreds of millions of dollars against Microsoft and their antitrust behavior and hurting other inventors as they built their business 
uh, off of the backs of many people as Gates was building up his Microsoft Corporation. You have no idea how many lawsuits as defendants these major players are. If you just looked it up, it's staggering. There's hundreds and hundreds of cases that these major companies have to defend themselves against. And they're not all ambulance chasing cases they're not all frivolous. Many of them have merit. But anyway, I spoke to Gene Crew as well. I was able to call his house on a weekend. He came to the phone. I almost got him to get on board, but it just wasn't going to happen. All this is luck and timing. So much of what I'm teaching you about is from experience. It's to keep you out of lawsuits. It's about how to build castles around your ideas, your contracts, your patent claims, your trade secrets, how to do this right, how not to make any missteps, not how to make any mistakes, how to limit the downside damages, how to keep yourself from being attacked and how to mitigate those attacks. And should you be attacked, You'll know what to do and you'll have that option of doing it on your own and doing it under some of the guys that I'm teaching you. So the other major takeaway of this video on submarine patents is this. Don't file paper patents. This video series is supposed to be an aid to help you cut down your work clock how many years and hours you need to punch a clock for either yourself or somebody else. It's about getting you money that you earn from your invention, from your new and improved product. It's about cutting down your work clock, getting you to earn more money, and it's a lifestyle change. That's what it's about. I'm basically trying to teach you how to craft your own lottery ticket, do it right, and protect it in the interim. So two things. You can't file a submarine patent. We know that. And don't waste your time. Don't file paper patents. Have proof of work. Have a prototype. Convince yourself that it's real. Write the claims. Write the specifications. Do the drawings. Submit the patent. And have confidence in it. And you be one of the 50% that makes it past the examiner because the other 50% get their knees knocked out and they don't get the patent. So get the patent, get the real patent, pursue your heart's desire and go out there and hopefully try to make money off of a realistic invention. Okay, I spoke too much. I'll see you in the next video. But I just wanted you to know, I've spoken to many a giant killer and those were just a handful of some of the attorneys that came to the phone. I have a lot of experience in this, both as an inventor, a prototyper, a salesman, a marketer, and also as a federal pro se plaintiff that couldn't find a lawyer to take him on. So I had to do it on my own because I was that driven. Okay, I'll see you in the next video. God bless you all, and I'll see you around. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.